everyone, you know my name by now, and today I'd like to talk about Rust ID story as it is today. And not only that, I'd also like to highlight the historic context of the Rust ID story, also the design decisions behind some of the tools, and their current capabilities. But a bit, a couple of words about me. You may recognize me by my GitHub avatar, because we all live on GitHub or Twitter nowadays, so maybe that's better. Uh, or by my glorious code avatar. I am the maintainer of the Rust language server as of now, and I actually started working in Rust since 2017, where I enrolled in the Google, in the Google Summer of Code program under the Cameron, where I worked on the RLS itself. Now, since then, the, my prim, primary idea, oh, sorry, primary area of focus was DevTools, and so I've been doing that since then, and I'm also a member of the DevTools team. So, I split the content into four parts, the initial one being the early days, that I consider to be from 2014 to 2016, and because I'll cover quite some dates here, I just thought it would be good to get to put things into perspective and to lay them all down on a timeline. So the first, it would be good to get a point of reference out. So a good good point of reference would be the release of Rust 1.0. So the first stable release of Rust. However, the ID tool, the first ID tool had its initial comment even more than a year back in March 2014. Now it's called Racer, some of you may know it. And this is one of the snippets from one of the initial comments. I'd like to highlight that it remembers the days of different syntax, namely tilde t, which then meant box t. But unfortunately, or not, I guess it depends on which camp you are in, it was removed. So how it actually worked was it used the internal libraries of Rust itself, the parser called libsyntax. And what parser is briefly is a piece of code, a logic or program that transforms, that, that transforms the source code as a text into some form of a representation that your program can work with. We'll a bit more about on that later. And what it did is it bolted on the name resolution system on top of that parser and what we actually had because of it, or thanks to that, was jump the definition functionality. Because whenever you do a name resolution, what it basically is, is if we consider this example code very simple, and we aim to resolve the path, let's say A colon colon B, we need to know what sort of definition B refers to. So first we need to start from the beginning of the path, which is A, find what A refers to, and then recurs in the scope, yada yada yada. But in the end, the name resolution lets us jump the definition functionality, which is kind of like a staple IDE feature. And it also shifts the completion engine. So there are two kinds of completions that are important for it here. One is scope completion, so that's fairly easy because that's the same principle that's behind the name resolution. You just don't need to resolve the final part of the path, you just need to, you just need to list all of the available components and definitions at a given scope. And there's also a dot completion. So that's a bit more complex. So imagine you have an expression and then you type dot. You'd imagine you'd get a list of like methods and everything you can apply there, but it actually gets tricky in Rust because we have type inference and we have traits. For example, we can have a definition for which we implement like numerous traits, each of this these traits have some methods on them. We just need to know and resolve those traits first for a given definition to only then get final resolve of methods that are, that are available for a given expression. So that's pretty hard and unfortunately Racer had a very simple system but it didn't work too well with type inference. But it worked pretty okay in like average case. And finally, it was a CLI tool, so it wasn't an editor plugin or anything like that. Now next, uh, there was IntelliJ Rust plugin, which probably all or most of you know. And the developers, when they decided to implement a plugin for IntelliJ, were faced with a question. 
like whether they want to reuse an existing bits of code or not. And in the end, they decided not to. They wanted to re-implement their own thing using the existing JetBrains libraries. A bit more on that in a second. And a fun fact, it was actually written in Kotlin, which was JetBrains JVM-based language, which wasn't even 1.0 at this point. So how it managed to use the existing libraries was to use the GrammarKit parser generator. That's a library from JetBrains. And a quick refresher or introduction of what the parser generator is, it's a bit of a code or a program that you feed grammar, which is a set of rules how to define a program. And then on the other end, you receive two different programs, more traditionally, Lexer and Parser. So Lexer, what Lexer does is it converts the stream of characters into a stream of abstract tokens. So in this particular example, we have simple let A equals hello, and it's, um, it chunks that into different tokens. For example, we have let token, which is a keyword. Then we have A, which is identifier, punctuation, hello, literal, and finally, semicolon. So Parser, what traditionally does is it accepts the stream of tokens and it nets us some way of, some representation of a program that then you can further work on. And you can either have an abstract syntax tree or a concrete, I won't go into details right now. But equipped with this, with their own like Lexer and Parser, what they actually did, the developers, of IntelliJ was they bolted on the name resolution system, so that's very something similar or akin to what Racer did. They also added an indexing that powers the final references. So I'd like to stop here for a second and explain when you want to find a reference to a given identifier, you basically need to traverse all of the entire code, right? Because you the, there can be references like everywhere. And a, very simplified sense. So this data, when calculated, was sort of cached, and this operation is roughly called indexing, or you can see it as such. And further on, there were, there were numerous improvements to the plugin itself. It also had carbon integration, so the plugin itself knew how your project was laid out in the file system. And in 2017, they actually shipped their own type system on the IntelliJ side, so not using anything from a C, which is Pretty, pretty good. Later on, we have RFC 1317. It was opened in October 2017 and 2015, and it meant to tackle the problem of the ID tool, official ID tool from Rust itself. So it was, it was opened by Nick, and it covered two most important points. One is how we can extract the data from the compiler itself, such that it's ID ready and it can use it. And the other one covered how such a tool will look like, and all the particular details like communication and whatnot with the editor. After a long debate, a couple of months later, in February 2016, the RFC has emerged. And actually, we settled on a name. There are a couple of different names considered. One was Oracle, the other one was Writer. There was a couple of different proposals. And the, actually, the name that they actually settled on was Rust Language Server. But that's the part that they settled on. But they also discussed very in depth how we can get the data. Should we compute it, the analysis data? Should we compute it on demand? Should it be incremental? And unfortunately, there was no resolution. So they just meant that, OK, Rust will just give us some data. We can work from there and improve it incrementally as we go. This brings us to another section, which is which covers RLS. And for me, it spans from 2016 to 2018, which is where it has seen most of the development. And that's not to say the development, that development has stopped, but yeah, the, it has seen most active development then. The prototype was cr quickly created by Nick Cameron and Jonathan Turner, then from Mozilla, at the end of August in 2016. And fun bit is that it actually originally pulled an entire Tokyo and hybrid because the communication, the protocol wasn't resolved yet, and they experimented with HTTP first. But then they settled on Stud.io and LSP. 
couple of days later, the RLS was announced on Roscon 2016. And it was meant to be like the go-to IDE tool. So whatever you wanted to get from IDE, it did that for you. So whenever you wanted to perform on your code, whenever you want to you know, resolve how your project is laid out, the tool had to understand it all. And it also got auto completion from Racer and yada yada yada. To come back to the original, to the previous point of getting the data, how it was actually implemented, is that Rust C had seen a feature implemented called the save analysis, and it was enabled by passing a dash C save analysis flag, which actually, well, saved the analysis bits of the compilation, but unfortunately the name kind of stuck, so the data itself, or the API, however you wish to see it, is also called save analysis. And only then, the resulting data was used by RLS, and that's to show that it's entirely decoupled from the internals of the compiler itself. It aimed to be very sort of, maybe not very, but a bit more stable API to the compiler, rather than just relying on the internal APIs and have your tools break with every nightly release. But because the data, the compilation is always local to a given crate, we, for a crate graph, when you compile a crate graph, you actually get multiple of these files. So we need to add an intermediate step that lowers all of these into a single and coherent sort of global view into how your code looks like. So that's the final step that RLS interacts with. So to sum it up, the mode of operation is as follows. Whenever it uses changes a file, it instructs and orchestrates Rust-C and Cargo to build your project, then it forces it to generate the save analysis files, which can only then be lowered into database, which can only then be used to be queried by RLS. And that's a bit of work, unfortunately, so it's not incremental or on demand. To get into the meat of the data itself, because that's what defines what the RLS can do, its capabilities. The data was it revolved around a simple concept of definitions and references. So Rust C, whenever it compiled a crate, it recorded for every definition you have, so like struct or enum or function, something that you can refer to, it, re it dumped a definition in that index that it generated finally. And then whenever it did its name, internal name resolution step, as it normally does during compilation, it also recorded every reference to a result definition also in that file. And this simple concept actually gave us staple features such as jump to definition. You can see how that works. When you point a cursor in your file, then you could just ask the index what's a reference at a given cursor. And then if you find it, you can just jump to definition that links to directly. And you can do the inverse very easily. So for every definition that's under your cursor that you're pointing at, you can find all references that it refers to. And also stuff like rename is just trivially final references and basically rename all the identifiers to very simplify that. It also contains a little bit of more information about the definitions, such as documentation, which allows us to like see all the documentation when you hover over different identifiers in the code. But as time went on, the safe analysis and thus its functionality has expanded. So we firstly extended it with trade hierarchy. So we recorded what are the super traits for every trait. We also recorded every info block for every definition. And this is cool in a sense that this allowed us to, for example, when you point a definition, you can easily see what traits are implemented for a given definition. Now there are a lot of, there are a lot of other different, maybe niche stuff, like one of them is Glob views resolution. So at one point, maybe it still is, I'm not really sure, Glob view statements were considered an anti-pattern. So what Rust-C did is that for every Glob resolution, it recorded which specific identifiers it pulls in, because it still has to know that during the compilation. So it just recorded that definition in the safe analysis index. And then on demand, on user's demand, it can just replace that use Glob statement with an actually pulled in definitions. An interesting bit is that at one point it even had an ASD borrow check data. And that's 
cool because it allowed you to visualize all the regions where in which scope that variable was valid. And this helps us with the learnability factor where a lot of the most beginners were struggling with the borrow checker as is. This was meant to be more in depth, more deeply integrated with editors, but unfortunately it wasn't and we knew we will migrate to NLLs anyway, so unfortunately it didn't go very far. But I would also like to talk about completion and how we can model completion in this way. And the short answer is you can't really, <laughs> because you have to, for every expression, you have to encode a very long list of valid completions, which would load out the save analysis very fast. And since the Rust compiler gave us that information after like a couple of keystrokes, you could see how that can expense it very fast. Now also, you can imagine that it first needs to accept a sort of valid Rust code. So for example, if you type let a equals expression dot, when you instruct Rust C to compile that, it just goes like, yeah, I don't know what to do with this. So it, did, it couldn't get even into an expression itself, so it couldn't know how to complete it, unfortunately. And that's a big pain point for the RLS. And you could see that as we drafted a 1.0 release candidate, that was in August 2018. Maybe some of you remember that, but the users were not really happy with how things work. And the biggest pain point that was highlighted by the users is the lack of full and proper completions. And we can see how that backfired really, really quickly. Only racer, we only had completion data from Racer, so that wasn't complete at that point. So from then, we focused on polishing the RLS as is. We aim to reduce the latency, which was perceived by the users such that it took a long amount of time whenever you did change your code to get the feedback because of the way how the system was designed. But we also tried to improve, improve the project support, which also people said was fairly lackluster. And there's also one cool bit that we work on now, which is auto process compilation. RLS, as of now, compiles your code in process. So it runs Carga and C in process. So you can imagine when you compile a graph of 200 dependencies, it has to compile each of those dependencies in one process. So you can see how that limits parallelability very much. And this brings us to REST Analyzer. And I consider it like it started roughly in 2018. But before we go specifically into REST Analyzer, I'd like to talk about the RFC that was open that led to the tool itself. Matplot opened a PR at the end of December 2017, and the idea was to share a common parser between Rust-C and an IDE tool that can be then used and not duplicate the effort, because the RLS model was obviously deemed not ideal, and yeah, let's leave it at that. So the parser aimed to retain more of the information that was maybe not necessarily required for Rust C, but could be handy for the ID, such that, such as that, it retained information about punctuation and all that, so you could like move stuff out of scope, etc., and have it form it nicely. So the proposal was to have a concrete syntax tree, which is syntax tree with a punctuation. In the meantime, the infrastructure powered that powers incremental compilation in Rust-C has matured greatly. And the reason I mention this is because it wasn't even considered practically in the ID RFC because it was simply too immature. People didn't know how to architecture that system. It was, I would say it was a bit too early for that. But the stable version of incremental compilation landed with Rust 1.24, which is February 2018, and as it turns out, the design of the system was sound, was good, it was proven. So the gist of it, the core, was extracted into a separate library called Salsa. And that was around September 2018. And it revolved around queries, which 
which are functions from type k to type v, and there are two different types of those queries. One are inputs, which are functions that you can think of as pull values from that are given to the system or are pulled from the environment. And the other ones are functions, which are considered to be pure. And this actually allows us to memoize the result of those functions. And you can see how that's good for the incrementability, because if you change one of the inputs and the rest of the computation stays roughly the same, we know it's a pure function, so for every argument it gives the same result. We can just reuse the result computed previously to net us the incrementability. Now, one example how you can see how it's good in the IDE setting is like getting the type of, let's say, expression or a different node in the IDE. We know that the, when expression doesn't change or the inputs to the expressions don't change, it has to have the same type. So we can build our IDE structure like query engine around that completely. Now, combining the lib syntax to research work, which gave us a lexer and a parser, and a salsung, which we can easily model lazy compilation, this combined it gave us a pretty functional tool, which is Rust Analyzer. It's a bit of code that can transform your source code, parse it, and then perform some analysis. It's pretty good. Now, the goals of it is that Rust Analyzer was reimagined as a different take on an IDE-ready compiler frontend, and a frontend constitutes of something like lecture and parser, maybe name resolution, bits that lead to a representation that you can do further analysis on. Now, it had its heavy focus on the laziness. So when you compare that to the mode, let's say, how RLS worked in, if you asked RL, if you changed something in the RLS and then you asked it a question, for example, jump the definition, it had to time check the entire crate, it had to name resolve the entire crate only so it can feed you the response you wanted. However, in this model, we just do the bare minimum we need to know the correct answer. So you can see how that saves a lot of time and effort. The another bit is to be able to reuse and share probably with Rusty what we can. For example, they that the developers didn't want to re-implement the entire time system because that would be crazy. So they actually took a bit that was that aims to be the sort of a next gen trade solver that aims to replace the one currently in Rush C and integrate with this instead. And also another tangentially, maybe orthogonally rather, thing or goal was to be separate from Rust C. And that's good because Building Rust C from ground up is not easy. It takes a lot of effort to just, you know, from zero to fully functional compiler built on your machine. So we wanted developers to not do that. And thankfully, whole Rust analyzer just works out of box and is compiled and stable. So that's you can see how that is very easy for the contributors to set up. So to compare the mode of operation is as follows. Our Rust analyzer, whenever a user changes inputs, it informed the salsa, the query engine of the, these changes, and then whenever it did the queries, the engine only then performed the lazy updated computation. So it's a lot simpler than the entire thing in orchestration with Rust C. And a bit on, on the current capabilities of Rust on Rust analyzer, it mostly works. Most of the stuff you'd actually consider for the ID will just work. It actually works so good, it handles the compiler itself. So you can right now download and use Rust Analyzer when you contribute to Rust C and expect most of the stuff to work correctly. Now, macro expansion has improved quite a lot, so this is one of the factors that contribute to, to this. And because of this, it, handled, uh, it handles a substantial subset of a real life Rust code really cool. <coughs> On the other hand, we don't have diagnostics in the Rust analyzer itself, and we need to res re resort to running cargo check directly. Because of this, you need to first save your files, because cargo check has no way to be informed what the content, what the contents of your in-memory files and editor look like. And also, references are still not indexed, so stuff like final references doesn't work, 
but the rest is surprisingly good, so please give it a try. Now, this brings us to Working Group RLS 2.0. It was organically formed at Rust All Hands this year, so that, that's in February, and it had its goals crystallized such that it will focus on Rust Analyzer as a driving project or yeah, the driving project, and the main focus would be to explore how an IDE-ready compiler frontend looks like. What's also interesting is that the another concern was it would be good to split a monolith, which is Rust-C, into more reusable and clearly defined libraries. And this helps not only with specking the language itself, it also helps understand the code base greatly. And somewhat of a secondary concern, it also aims to bridge the RLS and the Rust analyzer effort because it's very confusing for the users. They wonder which one's better, and the debate is often very heated, and people have strong opinions, especially on Reddit. <laughs> the first fruit of the work was Rust C Lexer. So that's a library. PR was opened in July this year called the Essence of Lecture, and what it did is it pruned the old Lecture implementation in the Rust C itself and replaced it with a stable on the library, which actually allows us to share a Lecture between Rust C and Rust Analyzer. So that's great. And how does it look today? Well, we continue to improve the existing tools, so still working on RLS, still working, working on Rust Analyzer. Obviously, IntelliJ Rust is mature and going strong. We like to unify the RLS and Rust Analyzer more because, as I mentioned, it's very confusing. It splits the code base, it splits the resources, which are contributors and whatnot. So it'll be kind of good. It was, it was the item of recent meetings on the compiler team, so it'd be good to resolve that. And who knows? Rusty also internally works on polishing around the rough edges and abstracting the internal libraries. So who knows, maybe we'll see some other bits extracted in the near future. So to come back to the original question, are we ID yet? I'd say no, unfortunately. But we're almost there. We're almost there. You'll have to bear with us. Thank you.